City Church from my home here on the southeast side of town. We want to welcome you to week 14 of our gathering uh, online. Uh, when Aquinas College is not opened up yet uh, with the pandemic and they're not going to open until July. So we are still here online. So grab your uh, favorite cup of coffee and uh, get ready to dive into God's word with us uh, together this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 105. Uh, I'm going to be reading the first three verses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Uh, sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing this morning from wherever you're at, uh, from your living room uh, and ours. Uh, we're going to be seeking the Lord's presence this morning, uh, seeking his uh, strength for our lives. And so if you are drained, tired out by all of the craziness going on in life right now, we want to invite you to just come seek the Lord's presence with us this morning. Wherever you're at, we invite you, we want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, Redemption City, let's sing together. This is my Father's world. This is my Father's world. And to my listening ears All nature sings and round me rings The music of the spheres This is my Father's world I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear Him pass. Speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong god is the ruler yet this is my father's world the battle is not done jesus who died shall be satisfied earth and have be one Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and have be one
was alone. I was alone. I couldn't find my place till heaven reached down. Your love it called my name. Out of my shame, out of the dead of night. Into a hope, into your marvelous light. It's your mercy. It's your mercy. I don't deserve your mercy. That you would reach down for me and keep me as your own. For your glory, I'm living for your glory. I will tell the story of your unfailing love. Be glorified, be lifted high in all my life. Be glorified, though I may run, though I may fall. Chasing this world, things that will break your heart. But faithful and true, sure as the rising sun. One thing is true, one thing is sure to come. It's your mercy, I don't deserve your mercy. That you would reach down for me and keep me as your own. For your glory, I'm living for your glory. And I will tell the story of your unfailing love. Be glorified. tasted and seen, and I've tasted and seen that you are good, you're walking with me just like you said you would, and all that you say, every word is true, oh whom shall I trust? Jesus, I trust in you. I've tasted and seen that you are good. You're walking with me just like you said you would. And all that you say, every word is true. Oh, whom shall I trust? Jesus, I trust in you. Be glorified. Be lifted high in all my life. Be glorified. Be glorified. Be lifted high. It's your mercy, I don't deserve your mercy, that you would reach down for me and keep me as your own. For 
your glory. I'm living for your glory. And I will tell the story of your unfailing love. Sing, O oh great God, O oh great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart, own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power, let no vice or sin remain. That resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me. Make me yours forevermore. I was blinded. I was blinded by my sin. Had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me through the God. Son gave me endless hope and peace. Help me now, help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. O oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name. are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. O oh, great God of highest heaven, glorify your name. Hey Redemption City, this is Andrew Pinaggio. Hope you're all doing well. Um, our vision as a church is to be a biblical family. And one of the things I love about the fact that we are a biblical family is that it's not just us, it's not just Redemption City that is a family. God's family extends across the globe. We have brothers and sisters all over the world that we can really call our brothers and sisters. Um, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit hard across the globe. Uh, and there are some places that it has hit way harder than it has in Grand Rapids, or there at least the needs are exacerbated all the more. So we as a church, we've been saving money the past several months because we haven't been meeting and paying rent. Um, so we as a church, we're able to take some of the money that we've saved and we've, we've sent it to a church that had some needs. And the church is called Esperanza Viva. It is uh, Adriana and my home church. We spent several years there. Maria and Flavio also spent time there. Um, it's a place that is very close to our hearts. So we sent some money and uh, the pastor there was able to distribute some of the funds um, and buy some basic needs uh, for the people of the church and give some, some gifts, some financial gifts as well to different members. So we wanted to uh, just share some of the stories uh, and some of the people that sent a video back saying thank you. So uh, enjoy these these short videos of thanks from our brothers and sisters in Lima, Peru.
hermanos de la Iglesia Redentor de la ciudad de Chur. Soy la hermana Juana Velázquez de la Iglesia Esperanza Viva, donde nuestro amado pastor Luis Duarte el día de hoy trajo una bendición muy grande para mi casa. Y estoy muy agradecido con ustedes, hermanos, por haber compartido conmigo esa bendición. Muchísimas gracias por tener ese corazón generoso y amoroso para con los hermanos. Dios añada y multiplique la generosidad de ustedes. Que Dios los bendiga grandemente, Iglesia, el Redentor de la Ciudad de Chur. Bendiciones. Hola, Iglesia de la Ciudad de la Redención. Le agradecemos infinitamente por la provisión y por la bendición que nos han dado. La familia aquí, Romero, mi familia, les agradece infinitamente por su gran aporte, a pesar de las circunstancias que todo el mundo estamos pasando. Un, dos, tres. ¡Gracias, hermanos! ¡Que Dios nos bendiga! Hola, somos Isaac y Rebeca de la Iglesia Esperanza Viva en Lima, Perú. Queremos agradecer al Señor por su fidelidad y a la Iglesia Redemption City Church por su colaboración y su apoyo, y por permitirse ser bendición para nuestras vidas. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Osvaldo Bereche, y en representación de mi familia, le agradezco de todo corazón a los hermanos de la Iglesia de Estados Unidos por este donativo económico que nos han dado, especialmente a mi familia. Realmente lo necesitábamos. Acá la situación de la pandemia está un poco fea, pero realmente este, le agradezco por ese apoyo ¿no? de, de que nos dan los hermanos de, de Estados Unidos, en la cual no nos, conoce, no nos conocen, pero de todo corazón tratan de ayudar a las personas cristianas como nosotros a apaciguar nuestra situación. Le agradezco de todo corazón y espero que su iglesia siga así, que Dios siga bendiciendo sus vidas, que Dios siga orando cada persona, cada familia de, de esa iglesia hermana en Estados Unidos. Le pido muchas bendiciones y que Dios siga utilizando sus vidas para seguir este, <coughs> haciendo más caridad con otras personas. Dios los bendiga de todo corazón. Gracias, hermanos. Hola, mi nombre es Ricardo Duarte. Agradecemos a, la, a los miembros de la iglesia Redemption City Church por la bendición recibida. Todos estamos agradecidos con ustedes por su bondad y generosidad. Buenas noches. Gracias, a todos. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, hey, Redemption City. I also get to do announcements this morning as well. And so if you're new, welcome. We are so glad you uh, found us either on YouTube or over on uh, our Facebook page and so welcome to you if you are looking to get connected you can always go over to our website and fill out our virtual connect card on our uh, connect tab and all and we'd love to get you more connected to the life of Redemption uh, City Church that way um, also we're always trying to be uh, just doing more to cultivate biblical family so even during the time of COVID 19 we've still been trying to get together one of the rhythms we've been doing is uh, getting together on zoom after the service at 11:15, and so today we're gonna bump that back to 12:30. our community is doing a watch party and so we want to have some time to get together but we still want to connect with those of you across the church we'd love to just check in i'd uh, love to hear how you're doing get a chance to catch up and pray uh, for you and also of course other communities are meeting in various times and places and locations some of them live some of them still on zoom and so i'd uh, love to encourage you to just continue to be family uh, during this season you can find the link to that zoom chat on our private facebook group or over on our email and so a couple updates that i have for you uh, many of you have been asking about reopening plans uh, when are we going to be getting together again in person and uh, uh, we know uh, other churches are starting to uh, get together and so we also are excited about getting back together in person as soon as possible. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 reminds us uh, that there is something special that happens when we gather together, it just stirs us up to love and good deeds. So we can't wait till that happens. Um, in the meantime, uh, we're waiting for Aquinas College to open back up. Um, yeah, they're still trying to put together their 
own reopening plans. And so that's not going to happen till July. And so we've still got uh, some time here that we're going to be doing throughout the month of June and probably early into July as well uh, on this uh, particular page and, or on this particular uh, venue here. Uh, and so uh, we're also trying to figure out how to deal with 40 to 50 kids and how to social distance them. And so, yeah, we just really appreciate wisdom for our elders as we're trying to make some wise decisions. We know some of you are so excited to get back together again in person and others of you are are worried right with good reason right this virus has killed a lot of people and so there's still a lot of concern and worry and anxiety out there we recognize that there are people on both sides of that spectrum and so uh, if you just pray for our elders as we have wisdom navigating um yeah just just being wise in terms of what it looks like to care for people uh, keeping everybody safe but also um, recognizing just the value biblically of all of us gathering together in one place in worship. There's something powerful, there's something transformative about that, and so we are excited to do that again as soon as possible. In the interim, we are encouraging everybody who's comfortable with it to do watch parties. Um, we're specifically thinking in communities, but anyone could host a watch party, obviously, at their house. Um, but these would be an incredible opportunity, right, for you to invite maybe a smaller group of people, a little closer circle, um, maybe a little less risk um, to be doing it at homes and to be able to have the Lord's Supper together, um, to be able to share some time and community together. We do feel like this season offers opportunities for unique uh, fellowship that we want to press into and encourage uh, continue growing those relationships in your community or just have some friends over to your place or hang out in your backyard, watch the sermon together. Uh, we think that would be a great way to spend these next couple weeks as we're trying to figure out what reopening looks like for us at Aquinas College. And then finally, a quick associate pastor search update. Uh, we presented last week just a brief uh, frequently asked questions document to get you up to speed with some of the questions that have emerged from each of you around this process so far. We're so thankful for that. If you haven't gotten a chance to read that, check that out on our email from last week. Um, uh, just trying to answer some of the questions you have had about this process. Uh, we really didn't want to move forward in the process without uh, meeting uh, Josh for in person. And so one of the things that uh, Governor Whitmer's uh, opening things up here for outdoor gatherings has done is allowed us to be able to invite Josh over to our communities uh, to be able to visit. Some of you have already gotten to meet Josh in person. Others of you are still waiting, but we are uh, really excited. We think everyone in our, we want to give everyone the opportunity at church to meet our associate pastor candidate before we make that hire. So as questions are coming up, um, as you get to talk to him, we would love to hear your feedback um, from that process. Our last step in the process, having Josh come and preach on June 28th on this format. He's going to be on YouTube and uh, Facebook, so you can be tracking along. We feel like that's the best way to get his sermon to the most amount of people, and then we would love to hear feedback from you as our search committee gets together to finally uh, decide uh, based on what we've heard and what we've seen so far to offer Josh a uh, job here at Redemption City. So we're really excited to bring in that process into a conclusion. If you have questions, again, talk to anybody on the search committee, Kevin Voss, Andrew Panaggio, John Holderbaum, Cesar Mahari, Josh Rickard, uh, or myself or my wife, Jamie. And then finally, um, uh, we want to continue to recognize uh, this is a season of economic hardship for some. And so if you need any help during this season, if you're struggling, work stuff, uh, working part-time, working half-time, not working at all, uh, whatever the situation may be. If you need any kind of financial help, we would love to be able to do that. It's been awesome as a church for us to be able to help people out in our church that have needed it, uh, to be able to help nonprofits in the city uh, right now, to help church plants around the country, and to even be able to help some of the hardest hit places around the world uh, with our COVID-19 relief fund. So uh, very excited to be able to serve with that there. And, and if you call Redemption City Home and you still are drawing a paycheck during this season, we would, we would ask you to continue to generously uh, give to support the work of the church here. Um, we are so excited about what God is doing, where God has us during this season, and this exciting opportunity to bring on another uh, pastor here to continue to see this work grow and flourish here in Grand Rapids. So we would encourage you uh, yeah, to continue generously uh, giving. You can give online or you can text any dollar amount to 84321.
one. And so we will have our scripture reading next. Good morning, Redemption City. My name is Susie. I'll be doing the scripture reading. We are reading Jonah chapter 1, verse 17 to chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Redemption City Church. Uh, we are in the uh, midst of a series on the book of Jonah. We're calling God's heart for uh, the city. And it is a great book, a masterpiece of literature. It is full of all kinds of incredibly comic turns. Uh, we have this prophet who's running from the presence of an omnipresent God. That's pretty hilarious. We're supposed to chuckle at that. We have this prophet who's running from the God who made the land and the sea on a boat. We're supposed to kind of uh, get a little laugh out of that reality. And of course, uh, what could be better than a great fish coming and swallowing this prophet up uh, and then vomiting out on the land back on mission. This book is full of humorous and ironic turns and we're supposed to enjoy uh, the author's literary masterpiece here as he uh, brings a, a level of comedy to bear in the midst of this story. But as we dig deeper, um, we see Jonah's refusal to participate in God's mission of mercy actually points us to a far more troubling problem. Right? You can have uh, absolutely orthodox theology and be a total jerk. You can have uh, totally solid theology and be filled with hate. You can, be, you can have rock solid theology and be prejudiced. You can have rock solid theology and be a racist. Uh, these are the problems which Jonah confronts us with. Here is a man that is the prophet of the God of heaven and earth, but he doesn't care about what God cares about. He doesn't share God's heart of mercy for the people in our story. And so this book uh, not only exposes Jonah's unwillingness to be a part of God's mission of mercy, it holds up a mirror uh, to God's people for, of Israel for their refusal uh, to share God's mission of mercy to the nations. And for us today, it holds up a mirror to our hearts as well. Do we share God's heart of mercy for the nations? Do we share God's heart of mercy for our city? Uh, do we share God's heart of mercy for those uh, in our culture right now who are struggling and hurting? Uh, those that maybe aren't a part of our tribe or part of our team. Uh, does, do we share a mercy that's bigger than our uh, little parochial agenda? Those are some of the things that the book of Jonah really challenges us with. And they are, uh, they're helpful, right? These are, these are gut checks for us. This uh, book of Jonah has, as a prophetic book, right, it packs a punch. Um, there's a, a pro prophetic edge to this book, and it's pretty sharp, right? It's going to challenge us uh, to consider whether we, in fact, uh, whatever our wonderful theology is, whether we actually share God's mission of mercy for 
the city. And here in chapter 2, uh, we see that Jonah can run no further. He is at uh, rock bottom. And so we get to sit with him in the belly of the great fish as he wrestles with the mystery of God's mercy. And so the big question here in chapter 2, is Jonah going to return to God's mission of mercy? He's been running the other direction. Is he going to return to that mission of mercy that God has for him? And of course, the big question for us, right, is are we personally moved by God's mission of mercy? Uh, we're going to see uh, the story uh, unfold in a few movements here. I want to look at we're going to see this morning Jonah hit rock bottom. Uh, we're going to see Jonah experience God's mercy, and we're going to see Jonah respond to God's mission of mercy. And my aim for us this morning is that we would wrestle like Jonah with the mystery of God's mercy, with God's heart uh, for those people um, yeah, outside, you know, those enemies that we might have in our own lives or people that are different from us, people uh, that don't share all the same values and beliefs that we have. Uh, do we share God's heart of mercy for the outsiders, for the marginalized? Um, that's the challenge I'm hoping this book uh, allows us as a church to wrestle with, right? Do we share God's heart of mercy for uh, the city? So let's pray. Father, we uh, identify, God, we can identify, if we're honest, with this prophet, this runaway who doesn't want anything to do with your mission of mercy. He knows how messy, he knows how complex, he knows how difficult it is to wade into, uh, God, a mission of mercy with people that are different from you, uh, with people uh, from a different backgrounds and different ethnicities, and uh, particularly people that are enemies in this context, Father. And so uh, we confess, God, we're not ones that want to jump into some of these difficult missions of mercy you have for us. Uh, we like our comfort, we like our security uh, far too much to step out in faith uh, and take risks for the mission that you have for us. And so I pray this morning, uh, Father, as we uh, reflect more and more on your mercy, God, and uh, the way you come and pursue after us, God, that uh, just the, the uh, beauty of your mercy would land on us in new and fresh ways and that you would move us out on your mission of mercy as we reflect more deeply on all the mercy that you uh, have given to us. And so we pray uh, you come this morning, uh, you would speak to your people through your word and by your spirit. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with Jonah and his <laughs> trip to rock bottom. It's been all downhill since Jonah set out uh, from Joppa, or set out for Joppa in chapter 1, verse 3. And our narrator masterfully uses this imagery of going down to describe Jonah's spiritual trajectory, right? There's this narrative arc here. Jonah is on a downward spiral here in the book, starting in chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, But Jonah rose Instead of delivering the word of the Lord to Nineveh, he rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. And so the downhill journey begins as he runs away uh, from God in chapter 1, verse 3. Then in uh, chapter 1, verse 5, we see him going down into the ship for a nap because he's exhausted from running for God. And so you see in verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship and into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the innermost part of the ship. So he's gone down uh, from the hill country, uh, we're assuming, and down uh, to Joppa, to the port city, down to sea level. And now he has gone into the ship and down into uh, below the decks to sleep. Uh, but he can't even finish his nap before this great storm comes from God and the crew uh, reluctantly throws him overboard. Here in chapter 2, then, where we pick up our story this morning, Jonah is really going down, sinking down into the depths of the sea. And the majority, actually, of his prayer chronicle his distress at this downward uh, journey. And so... We see here in verse 2, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the valley of the fish, saying, and so he starts out uh, letting us know that he is praying to his God from the belly of the fish. 
Uh, and his prayer then chronicles that distress as it unfolds. Right, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again, look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down, here's, here's that phrase again, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. So, so this is Jonah's downward journey to rock bottom, right? In verse 3, Jonah recognizes this watery death as God's doing. He says, you cast me into the deep of the sea and the floods around me. All your waves and your breakers are crashing over me. Quoting Psalm uh, 42, 7, Jonah is just acknowledging and recognizing uh, this is God's judgment, right? He has run away from God. God has pursued him. God has hurled this storm at him. The sailors then had to hurl him into the water. But Jonah says, I know behind it all was you tracking me down, uh, relentlessly pursuing me with your tenacious grace and mercy. And so here Jonah is sinking down, down, down into uh, the sea. In verse 4, you know, Jonah, who's been running from God's presence, finally feels like he might have actually succeeded. He says, I am driven from your sight as he sinks into the dark and murky depths of the sea. He's like, I was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord, and it seems like at this point I might actually succeed. Uh, verse, uh, as he goes on uh, forward, even, even though he hopes to look upon the temple again, things are looking uh, very bleak, right? He says, I shall look upon your temple again. But as he goes forward in verse 5, things are not looking good at all. Uh, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds are wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain, at the roots of the mountains. And so you just kind of picture uh, Jonah as he sinks further and further to the floor of the sea, and he's surrounded by all the seaweed and algae, and uh, he's trapped there at the bottom of the sea in this downward journey, all the way down to the roots of the mountains. And you think, how much further down can you go than the roots of the mountains, the very bottom of uh, the sea? But in verse 6, he says, I went down to the land whose bars closed forever, right? This downward journey takes him all the way to the bottom of the sea, but it takes him to the very gates of Sheol, the very gates of the underworld, which in the ancient Near East, it was believed that the underworld uh, was like a great city, right, with gates and bars uh, there. And so as you died, you had to make this journey downward into uh, the underworld uh, and ultimately where you would be locked up forever, right? No return to the land of the living, right? The gates there, these bars that he talked about are not to keep people out, but to keep people in. And so Jonah has approached the very gate of death, you know, as his life is expiring, right? He cries out to uh, the Lord, but he's at rock bottom at this point. He has gone down from Joppa, down into the ship, down into the sea, down to the very gates of death uh, itself. And so we need to pause here uh, to see what we can learn from Jonah's downhill journey, right? Sometimes we have to make it to rock bottom before God gets our attention. I often quote the, the line by C.S. Lewis that God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And, and I give that quote all the time because it's so counterintuitive to us, isn't it? In our pain, we want to flee God. We want to run to other things. We run to substances, we run to entertainment, we run to uh, di various diversions. Uh, maybe we, we become more workaholics in our job as we seek to just kind of drown our, our sorrows and our pain in a world of work and busyness, or we try to escape through pleasure and uh, all of those things. And so we need to recognize, right, that, that our pains and our the pain points in our lives are God uh, often, are often ways God gets our attention, ways 
uh, God uh, points us to the needs that we have for him in our lives, right? Sometimes it takes a genuine crisis to get our attention, and, and a, ner- a near-death experience like Jonah's certainly has a way of sobering us. It clears away a lot of the clutter in our lives, helping us focus on what's most important. Uh, pastor uh, and author Tim Keller says it this way, it's only when you reach the very bottom, when everything else falls apart, when all your schemes and resources are broken and exhausted, that you are finally open to learning how to completely depend on God. That's where Jonah is this morning. He is at rock bottom. His only hope is God. And if you're looking for a testimony to this from someone who's not uh, an old white guy or a dead white guy, (laughs) um, I would love to direct you to uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, Harvard uh, commencement address, The Fringe Benefits of Failure and the Importance of Imagination. It's It's a great commencement address. Uh, full of wisdom and all. But she says this, I thought, which was so insightful about uh, her own journey to rock bottom. And I hope it is encouraging to you as well. She said this, and I want to quote her at length because uh, I thought it just gives very eloquent witness to uh, where, uh, what rock bottom can do for us as people. She said, I think it's fair to say that by any conventional measure, a mere seven years after my graduation day, I had failed on an epic scale. An exceptionally short-lived marriage had imploded, and I was jobless, a lone parent, and as poor as it is possible to be in modern Britain without being homeless. The fears that my parents had had for me and that I had had for myself had both come to pass, and by every usual standard, I was the biggest failure I knew. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that failure is fun. That period of my life was a dark one, and I had no idea there was going to be what the press has since represented as a kind of fairy tale resolution. I had no idea then how far the tunnel extended, and for a long time, any light at the end of the tunnel was hope rather than reality. So why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than than what I was and began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to succeed in the one arena I believed I truly belonged. I was set free because my greatest fear had been realized and I was still alive and I still had a daughter whom I adored and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom, became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. I love that. Rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. Have you been there, right? Have you been through a season like this where everything uh, inessential was stripped away, right? When you're at rock bottom, right, and you realize, you know, who you really are, right? You stop pretending that you're not somebody else and uh, you finally embrace who you are, where God has you, what he's doing in your life. Uh, Rowling didn't merely survive this season of failure. It helped her become the remarkable person she is today, right? And that wonderful Harry Potter series that has entertained uh, so many of us for so many hours and created such a rich imaginary world. All of that emerged right out of this season of suffering. How about you, right? Some of you are shaking your heads right now because you've been there. You've been to rock bottom and you've had all of those non-essential things stripped away in your life and you found God to meet you there in those moments uh, and uh, direct you to the places where he's calling you to be. Some of you may be there right now. You feel like Jonah right now sinking to the bottom. You identify this feeling of drowning, just the, uh, the sense of hopelessness and the sense of, um, yeah, nothing going as it ought. Right? If you're in a situation like that, this is a wonderful opportunity to come alive to who God is calling you to be, right? to strip away all that is inessential and to recognize what he's doing in your life. And for some of you, right, you're just hearing this, and you're like, wow, that sounds terrifying. I don't want to be in Jonah's situation or a rolling situation. It sounds really terrible. Um, And yet uh, these seasons can be seasons where God works deeply in our lives. So uh, hopefully these, uh, this text and this sermon series even prepare you for the moments in your life where you may be facing your own uh, crisis. But what I love about this story, and particularly the story uh, of Jonah, is it's in this moment, in this crisis, 
And when Jonah is absolutely dependent on God, right, that he finally experiences God's remarkable mercy, right? When, when he personally uh, gets a sense of the merciful God that he serves, right? Jonah is already, and I love this, God is, of course, already a step ahead of Jonah, right? Having already appointed uh, the great fish uh, in verse uh, 17, God has already prepared uh, and ordained the means of his deliverance. Even before Jonah cries out, <laughs> the fish is already there prepared to swallow up. We see this word appointed pop up three times in the text here, all showing uh, God's sovereign uh, control of this story. Everything is going according to his plans uh, for this prophet so that he can extend mercy to uh, Jonah. I love this in verses <clears throat> 1 and 2. We know that Jonah is praying, right? Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. And, and that he answered him. Uh, but we don't see his merciful response until verses 6 uh, through 9, which finally bring the long-awaited deliverance of God to our prophet as he is sinking down to the heart of the sea. And so we read in verse 6, uh, second part, um, Yet you brought my life from the pit, O Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will <coughs> pay. And so in verse 6, Jonah testifies that God brought his life up from the pit. In Hebrew, the pit is another word for the grave, another word for Sheol. It's in that same language there, right? We're thinking of the gates of the underworld here. Jonah's testifying that God swooped down and brought him up from the pit. And of course, he does so in the most unlikely fashion imaginable, right? God swoops down in his grace and mercy, uh, picks Jonah up in the belly of this great fish and brings him to safety. It's one of those great stories that we're still talking about today, the stuff of all the great children's stories, literature, uh, your, your Veggie Tales classics, whatever. Um, God swoops in to rescue Jonah uh, in a way that we're still marveling at today. Uh, God's mysterious means of mercy in Jonah's life are this great fish that would come and swoop him up. In verse 7, he says that his life was fainting away. When his life was fainting away, he finally remembered the Lord. If you'll recall, of course, Jonah has been running uh, from God, running away from the presence of the Lord. But here in verse 7, as he's sinking to the bottom of the sea, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the gloom, uh, he finally remembers the Lord. And though Jonah is at the very gate of Sheol, though his life is fainting away, God instantly hears his prayers and, of course, sends instant rescue again in this most remarkable uh, and memorable way, sending this great fish to rescue him. Jonah might have temporarily forgotten the Lord while he was on the run, but God has not forgotten him. In verse 8, he uh, denounces uh, the foolishness of idolatry, which is kind of ironic because the most responsive people in this book are idolaters like the sailors and uh, the Ninevites, but of course, Nona, Jonah does have to throw uh, a cheap shot in there against uh, the pagans here. Here, And though true, um, seems rather trivial considering the context. And then in verse 9, Jonah ends up on a note of thanksgiving for this unexpected and undeserved salvation. Uh, Jonah seems to be a religious stickler. Right? He is expecting judgment to fall on himself. Um, he's asking God to send judgment on the Ninevites. Um, doesn't seem like an incredibly compassionate kind of guy, uh, but he experiences here God's undeserved grace and mercy. And he's thankful. He's moved with thanksgiving. And like the uh, pagan crew back in verse uh, 1, he promises to sacrifice to the Lord. We're assuming back in the temple in Jerusalem, and he promises to fulfill his vow. And we don't know what that vow is, what he's, what he's exactly talking about. Uh, we're not given... Uh, the background here. But what I don't want you to miss is God's mercy to Jonah. <clears throat> God is always waiting with open arms for prodigal prophets and prodigal sons and daughters. Jonah may be sinking beneath the waves, but he's never out of reach of God's 
mercy. Though God is in his heavenly temple, his response to Jonah's cry is instantaneous. There is never a better time than when we are at rock bottom to cry out to God. And there's never a place where we are too far gone from his presence to, uh, yeah, to not be rescued by that great mercy. And so uh, Jonah is a story about God's incredible mercy, right? His incredible mercy to the sailors we saw in chapter 1. God's incredible mercy to Jonah, his runaway prophet here in chapter 3. And we're going to see God's mercy continue to extend further as this narrative uh, continues to unfold. But, but don't miss God's mercy in this text. God's mercy for you, God's mercy for runaways, um, God's mercy for those outside of the outside of the four walls of the church, those people that may be seekers or skeptics that you know in your life, God's mercy is overflowing in this text uh, to people that are seeking and finding him. So we've seen Jonah reach rock bottom and we've seen God reach down and rescue him from the pit in the most unlikely way. And lastly, uh, we need to consider Jonah's response to God's mission of mercy. If you remember back in chapter 1, this whole story started right with the word of the Lord coming to Jonah, telling him to preach to that great city of Nineveh. God wants to extend his mercy to the great city of Nineveh. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah ran from God. God chased him down, sent a great fish to swallow him up. And we're asked, we have to ask here in closing, so where is Jonah in regard to God's mission of Mercy. It's interesting he hasn't mentioned it in his prayer, right? There's no mention of, uh, you know, hey God, sorry for running from you and um, yeah, sorry for ignoring your mission of mercy to the Ninevites. I am ready to go. Sign me up. You know, it's just not really mentioned. Jonah is clearly thankful for God's salvation. Uh, Jonah has promised to offer sacrifices, um, we're assuming, back at the temple. And he's promising to fulfill his vows, and um, we don't know what those vows might be, whether that's uh, to go back to work for God or some other vows. We're not really told by the narrator. Uh, but Jonah does close his prayer with these remarkable lines, salvation belongs to the Lord. One of the great statements in all of Scripture, one of the great declarations by Jonah that salvation belongs to the Lord. And that last phrase, so important in uh, the book of Jonah, would seem to indicate that Jonah has learned his lesson. It seems like Jonah is acknowledging God's sovereignty and salvation. Um, God, I kind of wanted to limit your mercy, who you could save and what you could do, but I recognize that salvation belongs to you. I don't get to pick and choose who you show mercy to. Uh, salvation belongs to the Lord, and you get to extend it to whoever you want. And so it seems like even Israel's enemies, right? So it seems like Jonah maybe is getting it. But that doesn't explain uh, Jonah's continued hatred for the Ninevites in chapter 4, right? That's the complexity in the book of Jonah. We have this runaway prophet. Um, we have him uh, praying to God here in the middle of the story. And we're wondering, like, how authentic is this is this prayer how authentic is the repentance that he's giving and then in chapter 4 we see him really angry at God for extending mercy so there's this tension in the story right and commentators are divided on what to make of it right um, some commentators think that Jonah is so struck by God's mercy in the moment that he's able to transcend his prejudices his racism his hatred for the enemies of Israel and only later does he relapse into anger at God's mercy. And of course, that's totally plausible, right? Um, overwhelmed by God's salvation, you know, how he rescues him from the depths. Jonah is like, all right, you win. I'm tapping out. Uh, you can extend your salvation to anyone you want. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Sign me back up. I'm going to go back out on mission. But on the other hand, other commenters think Jonah may be thankful for God's mercy to him, but still doesn't repent of his disobedience to God. He still doesn't repent of his hatred for Israel's enemies, and that's why he doesn't even mention God's original call, his running away, or Nineveh at all in his prayer, right? You read David, like, in, you know, in the Psalms, and he's like, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is wrong in your sight, right? The psalmists will bring their 
uh, confessions when they sin to the Lord. We don't see that here in Jonah's psalm, in Jonah's prayer that he makes here in Jonah chapter 2. He doesn't seem to be at all contrite or repentant for running away from God. He doesn't even mention it in uh, the prayer. He doesn't mention his willingness to return to Nineveh. And so co some converts think he may uh, begrudgingly acknowledge that salvation belongs to the Lord, but he isn't happy about who God is in fact saving. While he doesn't share God's heart for the great city of Nineveh, he realizes at this point that resistance is futile. And so uh, it's hard to decide, right, what's going on here. Has Jonah really met with God, been overwhelmed by his mercy, and ready to go on mission, and then just kind of uh, relapses later on in the book? Or is this repentance uh, just thankfulness that God's willing to save him, uh, but not necessarily a total repentance, a willingness now to join God's mission of mercy? We're not sure. But what is clear, however, is that once this great fish vomits him out on the dry land, which is supposed to be another one of those wonderful comic elements in the story. We're not sure if this is a response to God's response to his less than heartfelt prayer. <laughs> you know, the fish vomits him up on the land or whether it's just one of the more comic elements in the story. But we do know that once Jonah is vomited up on dry land, he does return, however reluctantly, to God's mission of mercy. And he does journey to Nineveh. And we'll pick up that story uh, next week. Uh, but what is also clear, and I think this is even more important for us to recognize that whatever Jonah's attitude towards his declaration that salvation belongs to the Lord, this short sentence summarizes the theme of this book and summarizes the theme of the whole Bible. Jonah is a book about God's sovereignty in salvation. He can save whoever he wants. He can save pagan sailors, he can save runaway prophets, and he can save a notoriously wicked city. That's how vast and how wide his mercy is. Uh, and the theme of Jonah is the theme of the bigger story of the whole Bible. Salvation is the great theme of Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end, we have this story of God's salvation. Right? We know that salvation belongs to the Lord because He has planned it before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. Right? We know that salvation belongs to the Lord because He saved for Himself a people out of Egypt. Um, to be a kingdom of priests to the nations, to extend His glory outwards to the nation. We know that salvation belongs to the Lord uh, because the prophets promised, right, a Messiah who would come uh, and save God's people once and for all and extend His blessings outwards to the nations. We know that salvation belongs to the Lord because He purchased it at great cost to Himself on the cross. We know that salvation belongs to the Lord because He offers it freely to all who would believe. And we know that salvation belongs to the Lord right, because He continues to pursue people all over the world and bring them into this diverse global family that is the church. God is the great missionary uh, and the salvation that He has purchased is a salvation that he is still bringing to pass in the lives of countless people all throughout the world. And so what would it look like for us uh, to live like salvation really belongs to the Lord on uh, Monday morning? What would it look like for us to live into the realities of God's mission of mercy in our lives? Uh, first, uh, we've got to be thankful for God's salvation in our own lives, right? It's hard to appreciate a salvation you yourself have not re received. Jonah needs to appreciate God's mercy for him as a runaway prophet before he can understand God's mercy for wicked Ninevites, right? It's hard to be empathetic to other people in their sin, in their rebellion, in their doubts, in their fears, in their frustrations, uh, with life, with their questions, right? If you yourself have any doubts and fears and questions and sin and struggle in your life, and if you're still wondering about God's mercy for you, start here, right? God freely offers His mercy through Jesus. You have an opportunity to receive it this morning, wherever you're sitting, whatever uh, living room you're sitting, where these words come. I'm praying that God's mercy would just come and land on you like a a tsunami, like a tidal wave 
uh, of mercy, uh, that you'd experience the grace of God all because of what Jesus has done on the cross, right? All of God's anger uh, is spent on Jesus, so there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. As you bask in that mercy and in that grace, uh, would you, uh, would that begin to overflow out of your hearts for the people in your life? And second, um, if we're to live this thing out, what would it look like? We'd be thankful that salvation belongs to the Lord. Aren't you glad you don't have to save people? I mean, I can remember being at a pub theology session, uh, talking with a bunch of people who weren't Christians, and one of the one of the ladies that was there was like, you know, I'm so surprised that you haven't tried to save me yet. And I was like, what do, what do you mean? I, I don't have to save anybody. That's that's God's job. I just did to share uh, the good news of what Jesus has done, right? I get to share what Jesus has done in my life, right? That's that's my job. I get to share with you about Jesus, and God gets to do the saving work in our hearts. The pressure is off, right? We don't have to save people. We just get to witness to what Jesus has done in our lives. And finally, having experienced God's mercy, right, we can't help but see ourselves as part of God's mission of mercy in the world, right? How could we who have received mercy not share that mercy with the people around us, right? People who have experienced God's mercy most deeply, right, are the people share it most passionately, right? Think of the evangelist you know in your life, people that love to share the good news about Jesus, people that are always sharing uh, their testimony of God's grace. Uh, think of like the Apostle Paul, right? In the New Testament, he goes from persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail, killing them, right? To becoming the leading missionary in the local church. He said, man, I was the chief of sinners, but by God's grace, right? He has brought me into this family and I want to share with everyone the grace that I have uh, receive, right? Who are the people in your life you know that are passionate about sharing their faith? Usually people that have a great story. I can think of guys like uh, Chris Brissett, who was here last year at Redemption City, preached a bunch of times. He had a former gang member, all tatted up, spent time in prison, and God did a work in his life and his family and his passion for Jesus was so contagious. You just see that work of transformation God has done in his life and his family, and you're like, yes, that is exactly the good news of the gospel, right? Uh, God's mercy runs downhill to those that need it most. And so often, right, in church, we act like or pretend or think, right, that we got to get our act together to receive God's mercy and God's grace. We think if I can only conquer this sin in my life or this struggle or get over these doubts or these fears, maybe I can then receive God's grace and mercy. And we miss totally this unmerited beauty of grace that God extends to us in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our rebellion, in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our fears. While we, like Jonah, are running from God, uh, we can experience His incredible grace and mercy. Oh, that we would be a church that gets the enormity of God's mercy for runaways, the enormity of God's mercy for prodigals. Uh, oh, and that, oh, we'd be a church, man, that shares God's heart of mercy for our city, for the nations. Um, we pray that that would be so true of our church. So let me pray that, that might happen here even at Redemption City. And so, Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that it is displayed so beautifully for us in the story of Jonah, this runaway prophet. Uh, we thank you for how that mercy and its grace uh, is fulfilled for us in the cross of Christ, where you uh, gave your life for our sins um, so that we could be set free and be uh, ministers of your mercy to our city. And so we pray uh, even this morning that your mercy might fall on us in new ways. Uh, it would meet us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our doubts and our fears. And that as we experience more and more of your mercy, uh, that we might extend those mercy out into the relationships, into the pain, into the suffering, into the division uh, in the world we see around us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, we're here at the Fennec home. Margaret and I, my name's Matt, um, and we are going to sing a song for you today. So here we go. i 
We hope this gathering has been an incredible encouragement uh, to your heart, uh, wherever you're at, uh, in life, whatever's going on, uh, that just uh, time spent in the truth of God's Word would be a deep encouragement to you. And so before I send you out with God's blessing and the benediction, I want to remind you that we have been hanging out on Zoom uh, after church um, at 11.15, uh, but this morning um, we're going to be bumping that back to 12.30. Uh, our group is having a big watch party at my house, and so uh, we want to be able to hang out together, enjoy some brunch. Uh, but if you'd like to hang out with some other uh, folks from the church, uh, 12.30 p.m. on Zoom, we would love to gather, get to hang out with you, pray with you, uh, and hope that would be an encouragement to your heart. So now as we uh, send you out, I want to send you out with God's blessing. The benediction. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to be reading verse 16. Uh, now, may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hopes through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. Amen.